Uh, good afternoon. Um, welcome. Just a quick check. Stephanie, can can you hear me? Am I broadcasting? Okay, great. Well, thank you everyone for coming out. Welcome. Uh, about to start the webinar, which again, I appreciate you turning out for. A quick reminder that I'm, I'm going to spend uh, some time on Q&A once I'm done with the slides. I'm actually a little under the weather today, so we'll see how long I hold out, but I'm going to do my best. I'm going to start with a bunch of the questions that several of you submitted beforehand using that Google form. Uh, but if you want to ask any questions during the webinar, you can just scroll down on the page and you'll see that there's a questions pod and you can post it there. So I'm going to try to get to as many questions as I can as we, we get through today. Um, great. So the topic of today is key facts and talking points uh, for EMF advocacy. And uh, this is really more about just learning how to speak about these issues uh, for whatever purpose to whomever you want to speak to. Um, very quick outline of what we're going to do today. Uh, I'm going to have an intro very quick, just a little bit of background on me. Then we'll get into the main content, which I'm targeting for about 35 minutes. It's the first time I'm giving this talk. So we'll see actually uh, how long it takes. But uh, then I'll move in, give all of you a special offer, and then get into to Q and A. Um, is there a way for my can there? We so just very briefly about me, my name is R. Blank. I'm the CEO and founder of Shield Your Body. Previously served on the engineering faculty at the University of Southern California. And along with my father, Dr. Martin Blank, I co-authored Overpowered, which is a book about the science of EMF health effects. And this follows a 20-year career in software engineering. So as I said, a very, very quick intro <laughs> about me. So I, I really want to thank all of you for your interest in SYB and your desire to be an advocate for EMF radiation and health. The more of us that are out there spreading good, reliable, and effective information, the more rapidly we will be able to see effective and significant change. Earlier this, oh, didn't skip the slide. There we go. Oh, it skipped two. My apologies. Earlier this month, I emailed you a guide with a ton of resources to help you on this journey. This guide includes uh, videos, infographics, ebooks, and blog posts. I even threw in a couple of memes the first time that we've done any of those uh, to help share the content. And if you didn't get it, don't worry. It'll be emailed to you right after this webinar as soon as the recording is complete. You'll get a link to download it. And I designed all of this content specifically to help you learn how to communicate the serious issues of EMF radiation health and safety. See, I've been doing this work with SYB uh, and then previously with, with my father on Overpowered for almost a decade. And in that time, I've learned a lot about how to talk about the various issues surrounding EMF and health in a way that's accurate, that's convincing, and that's approachable. You have to, to do that in order to successfully run a company like this. And I know that a lot of you and uh, others of my customers want to learn how to do that too. Imagine if you could express yourself to your child in a way that got him or her to stop carrying their phone in their pocket and to do it without a fight. Or imagine if you were able to convince your yoga studio instructor to turn Wi-Fi off during sessions or imagine if you could get your child's school to go full ethernet. Well, I'm telling you that that stuff is possible. And this is how you start. And it's how you can start right now. The information that I'm covering today, uh, including all the resources, they accompany my guide that I wrote earlier this summer, how to talk about EMF with friends and relatives. And that was also the, uh, the subject of last month's webinar that I gave. And the link to down, if you don't have this, the link to download it is also in the resource guide, which is being emailed to you after the presentation. And if you haven't already, I really suggest that you check it out because that guide, the how to talk about EMF, that really provides a framework for all the information that I'm going to be giving you today. And having that framework is pretty crucial in terms of creating the opportunity for successful outcomes in your discussions. So as you go through the resources that I've assembled that you'll be emailed after this webinar, you'll see that I've created a structure for this information. Now, that doesn't mean this is a structure that you have to follow. 
uh, there's a ton of e information about EMF and health and safety. And a lot of it goes beyond even these broad categories. So instead, I've created this structure uh, as an overview of the content, as a way of introducing some of the key points that I found most effective in introducing people to the issues involved. So we'll get started with the first topic that you see at the top, why you should care about EMF. And again, I'm not directing this at you because if you've tuned out, turned out for today's webinar, I, I know you already care about EMF. This is about communicating with others. The why should you care about EMF uh, topic is what I call the icebreaker. It's a way of introducing EMF to those who don't know much about it, even if they've never heard the term before. This topic is broken into five parts, and that matches the other five items in the outline we'll be going through. As you'll note, I designed the information in a way that's accurate, but also calm, non-controversial, and in many cases motivates people to learn more, which is how I try to approach the, this, whole, this whole topic. Each topic is covered in one or two sentences. This gives you the opportunity to give a quick overview of the key issues and you can figure out which of these areas interests the person you're talking to. And then you can go into more detail on that specific subject. That's why I call this the icebreaker. So let's get into this. The first part answers the question, what is EMF? Because that's an important starting point if the person you're talking to doesn't know, or if they ask you, what is EMF? And this is I, there's many, many ways you could explain what EMF is. This is one of the simple ways that I found uh, to explain it. EMF stands for electromagnetic fields. It's a form of energy. A little is natural from sources like the sun and lightning. EMF also comes from all human technology. That includes power lines, appliances, and wireless devices. Again, nothing earth shattering there. That's really just, just the very top level of what is EMF. Now, why should you care about EMF? Well, while more and more people have heard things uh, like uh, cell phone radiation is thought to be harmful, a lot of people still think that there's a debate, or even worse, that the that that these uh, that the worries about EMF and health are are false, that they've been proven wrong. So, how do you cater to both of those people? Well, the way I approach it is by explaining first. Um, you break it down into two, there's really two key facts from, again, from a top level. There are tens of thousands of studies demonstrating health effects from EMF radiation, tens of thousands. And the World Health Organization lists this stuff as a class 2B carcinogen. So this is another example of finding a really complex and deep subject. And you'll see, we'll get into more of all of this later on, but uh, it, it's a really complex and deep subject and trying to find a way to communicate the key ideas in just a couple of sentences and to do it in a way that gets them to care and hopefully to want to learn more. Now, this topic, this part of the topic is, is a personal favorite of mine. I don't know for sure how well it resonates with everybody, um, but it, it what one of the key facts uh, related to, to e issues of EMF and health is that EMF reg regulations are a complex and ineffective mess. And it takes way more than a couple of sentence, uh, sentences to explain why that is. But you can give the key points in a way that gets people to be a little shocked, even if they don't care about the subject. So once again, I've broken this into two facts. A huge number one, a huge number of sources are not regulated at all. And two, uh, oh, sorry, on the first point, not regulated at all, that shocks a lot of people, uh, even people who may not have been caring about what you were saying beforehand, because it's, it's shocking to learn that there's no regulations on, on a lot of this technology. And again, I'll, I'll get into more detail on this later. Um, the second part is those sources of EMF that are regulated are effectively self-regulated. That gives manufacturers the room, a lot of room and leeway to cheat, deceive, lie, misrepresent, however you want to, to, to construe the situation. So a lot of sources uh, of EMF aren't regulated and many that are, are ineffectively regulated. 
Now we get to 5G. Some activists and advocates don't think we should highlight 5G as its own set of risks. And I understand why, because there is a ton of EMF out there. 5G is not the only dangerous source of EMF in our environments, uh, far from it. So why do I give a whole section of, 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 of my approach to, to talking about EMF to 5G? The short answer is because more people care. Even uh, if you don't want to spend all your time talking about 5G, it's a great and effective way to get more people more interested because they're already primed a little bit to care and to have heard some weird stuff about 5G and to, to hear that this is being rolled out and uh, so forth. So that's why I talk about 5G. As with everything we're talking about here today, you know, it's actually a really complicated issue. It's actually a really complicated set of issues. So how do I simplify my expressions about such a complex topic like 5G? Well, I break it down into, into two things. One, the frequencies used for 5G have never before been used in consumer applications. That's, it's the first time this stuff is, you know, a lot of people would like to think, you know, they're getting a new cell phone. It's basically the same technology. It's not. The second point, and this is personally, I don't know if everyone feels this way, but I know I do. The most uh, worrisome part of 5G to me isn't the frequencies, although that is significant to me. The most worrisome part is that it's not just for phones. A lot of people hear about 5G you know, on the news or on ads or whatever, and it's all about phones. Get the new 5G phone. Oh, the new 5G phone is coming out. Oh, 5G is now available in your area. So they think of it as just a replacement for 4G and LTE, but it's much more than that. 5G was engineered from the ground up to support the internet of things. That's an environment where everything in your life is uh, connected to a 5G network. So that includes smart cars, smart homes, uh, smart meters, everything in your life that right now isn't smart is dumb. It's not a source of EMF. It's going to become a source of EMF. And that means an order of magnitude explosion in the number of sources of this radiation in our environment. And for the final step of the overview, this is really, really important. We have action items. And this is critical because the whole point of whatever conversation you're having with somebody, whether it's your kid and not carrying the phone in the pocket or trying to fight a new cell tower in your neighborhood or anything in between. The whole point is to get someone to do something. And um, so you need to come armed with that ask, what you're gonna ask them to do, what, what change you are trying to see in, in that person. Now, if you follow my framework, you'll come prepared with that ask. But if you end up in a discussion that you haven't planned for, it's good to come prepared with general advice that people can implement. And that's where I say you can explain the two key rules of EMF protection. Number one is to minimize your use of EMF emitting technology. And number two is to maximize the distance between your technology and your body when it is in use. This is great advice because it's true, it's free, and it applies to everyone. People can get started immediately. So always, always come prepared with action items. And when you don't have them, always fall, but you can always fall back on explaining the two key rules. Okay, so that was the overview. That's the icebreaker, the conversation starter. So now we can get into each of those five topics in a little more detail. Pardon me, I said I was under the weather, I'm sorry. Uh, remember, I'm not here to give you a literal script. I'm here to introduce you to how I've learned to break these subjects down for people in ways of speaking about these concepts in approachable and convincing terms. But you always have to speak the way that you speak. And even more than that, you need to read your audience, the person you're talking to. What are they reacting to? What are they dismissing? What are they engaging with? If you've started with the icebreaker, hopefully you found your hook, the topic that you can engage with that, that person on. And that's when you want to dive in more deeply. And to start, we'll look at the, the question, what is EMF? 
Now, obviously, what is EMF? It's, it's kind of critical. It's core to what we're talking about because we're talking about EMF and health. So what EMF is, is obviously uh, central to that discussion. But here's the thing. Unless you're speaking to an engineer or a physicist, any more detail than the top level basic definition is going to be irrelevant, confusing, and distracting. EMF is a very complex subject. Uh, and and uh, the thing is, is most of it is actually irrelevant to, to what to what you're talking about. Think of it this way, when, when, uh, when we found out when chlorofluorocarbons were doing to the ozone layer, uh, they, we needed to react. We needed to stop putting so much CFC in our products that we were selling. Most people, even who knew that, didn't really know what a CFC was or what purpose it played. Uh, and, and you and, and and legislation was passed and and the world changed and and uh, really cut back on the amount of CFCs in our environment and it was done without anyone really knowing what CFCs were. That's really sort of the same situation with EMF because C EMF is very complicated, but it you do need to come prepared. I feel with 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 a simple definition because it is what you're discussing. So what is that simple definition? Well, it's like I said at the start. EMF stands for electromagnetic fields. It's a form of energy created by a combination of electricity and magnetism. But you don't want to spend much time on this because anything else, it's, gonna, it's, it's just going to distract from the key point uh, of your conversation, the key goals that you're trying to achieve. So instead, I recommend shifting this it to 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 a perspective that does apply to what you're trying to talk about and that's to try to give some uh, people some perspective on just how much of the stuff there is today and to start i explain that some emf is natural like sunlight and lightning because a lot of people who claim emf can't be harmful they say well emf is natural so it can't be harmful so you want first off to to agree it is some is natural but then you need to explain that there's a lot of EMF that isn't natural. It comes from human technology. This includes power lines, anything that runs on power, and any device that sends a wireless signal. These are all sources of EMF. And what's really critical to understand is that the amount we're exposed to, the amount of EMF we're all exposed to in the modern era is astronomically greater than what is found in nature. Uh, by some estimates, it's one trillion times greater. I have the the reference for this uh, calculation. Uh, it's in the the materials you're you're being sent after this webinar is over. If you want, there are some others that put it at an even greater value: four trillion, five trillion. It's a lot. And and keep in mind, this is what's ambient in a modern city. This isn't what you get by using holding a cell phone up to your head. This is what you get by walking around. And it's really important to, to convey to people the scope. And this has happened over the last 140 years because there was no human-made EMF before the light bulb. And now in the last 140 years, we're up to the point where what's ambient in the environment is a trillion times greater than what is found in nature. So just because some of it is natural does not mean it is safe. And you can get a better sense of that when you just see how much more of this stuff there is. So now we get to what many would consider to be the, the, uh, the main topic or the most important topic, and that is health effects. And this is obviously a critical one because the existence of health effects is precisely why we're all so worried about EMF in our environment and the unregulated rollout of more of it. But here's the thing about this, approaching a discussion of this topic. There are a ton of health effects. As I said in the intro, there are tens of thousands of studies. And that's pretty key because that's a lot. And it's a statistically significant value of studies, the number at which epidemiologists and public health officials start to take notice. So if you're interested in learning more about that massive volume of science, there are two sites in particular that I recommend. The first is the Bioinitiative Report. 
This website has a report conducted by an international team of researchers, in including my father, who was, who was an author of the Bioinitiative Report. And they surveyed thousands of studies and summarized their findings of the patterns they found in their review of the research. I like this one because it has a big scope. They, again, it surveys thousands of studies, but even more so because the team that wrote it actually wrote up their conclusions and analyzed the science in human language, language that normal people can understand. So that's a great resource. The second is emfportal.org. And I like this one because it has a searchable database of over 30,000 of these studies. So this one has a much bigger scope uh, than the bioinitiative report, but you also don't get the same level of interpretation and summary. So as you dig in, you'll see the effects range across basically every biological system in our bodies. And I think that's because our entire, for a couple of reasons, at least based off of my understanding of the current science, our entire body runs on EMF. There's not one system in our bodies that does not rely on EMF signals and energy for its function. So when you start overwhelming these systems with massive and unpredictable amounts of EMF, it's not surprising to find that these systems will malfunction. The second is because every system in our, D, uh, in, our, in our body is built off of cells that contains DNA. And there is a lot of science demonstrating how EMF negatively impacts DNA. But the point is, there's a ton of uh, data about the health effects of EMF, and it occurs across so many of our body's systems. And uh, the purpose of, of today's talk is, is how to talk about it. You can't just list off tens of thousands of studies. You can't just list off every biological system in, in, in conversation or in a presentation. So you, instead, I have a couple of suggestions. The first is focusing on the fact that there are tens of thousands of studies, because that's how much science there ha already is into the health effects of EMF radiation. Then you can try to get a handle on some of the variety of different effects that have been documented. Again, this depends on how much detail you want to get into in your, the specific conversation you're having. But that's what this inf infographic, which is in the resource pack you're getting, that's what this is for. As you can see, and again, it's just a summary, a top, very top level summary, but we have a wide range of effects, including cancer, infertility, miscarriage, and immune system disorders. As you look through the data, you'll note that there's way more than what I picked. I picked these because these, in my experience, are some of the most asked about. But if getting into the detail about the health effects is important to you, then do your research in advance about that subject in particular. So for instance, if you wanted to learn to prepare to speak more about issues with pregnancy in EMF or miscarriage in EMF, do your additional research there and, and come prepared. If, it, if it's uh, cancer, if it's infertility, do, do your research there. Um, but in general, you don't want to give people a huge laundry list. You want to give them something that summarizes effectively, or it summarizes uh, the information in a way that effectively conveys the scope and the scale of the health effects that we're all so worried about that science has documented, but without giving them a laundry list. That's, the, that's the, the, the trick with covering such a vast amount of data in, a, in an effective conversation. Now, there is another part of the discussion of EMF health effects that I found is very moving for a large segment of the population. And that's information about children because parents tend to care more about their children than themselves. And children are more vulnerable to damage from EMF uh, radiation for four reasons that you see here and that I go into more detail about in, in, in the resource guide you're getting. But they're, basically, their bodies are smaller, which means radiation penetrates more deeply. They're younger, so any damage that occurs in them has, particularly to DNA, uh, and biological systems, it has years and years and year, many more years ahead of it for that damage to replicate and spread throughout the biological systems. 
those are the two key reasons. But again, I have much more information about that in the resource guide. I've also considered, I'm sorry, included four of the uh, areas where children have demonstrated increased risk or increased health effects from exposure to EMF radiation. The links to the science, again, are all in, in the blog, uh, sorry, in the resource guide you're getting, but they include, and this is not a comprehensive list. I never, you can't do a comprehensive list of any of this stuff. I hope I'm getting that point across because it's such a complicated set of issues. And the more comprehensive you make your presentation, whether it's verbal or written or however, the more uh, you, your audience is gonna disconnect from what you're saying. So brain tumors, cognitive decline, memory loss, and ADHD. These are four of the areas where we've seen uh, increased risk for, for children. And the, the, the risk corresponds to the how young they are. So babies are more vulnerable than children. Children are more vulnerable than teens. Teens more vulnerable than adults. Now, for the next topic in the outline, we have regulations because a lot of people believe incorrectly that EMF is regulated for their safety. The thing is, is it's not. That's the simple and correct answer. But the issue is also more complicated than that. So here's how I try to break down that topic in an approachable and understandable way. First, it's three parts. First, many sources of EMF are not regulated at all. That includes power lines and cars. Think about that. We're surrounded by power lines basically everywhere we go in modern society, but these emissions are not regulated. The same is true for cars, where many of us spend many hours each week. Think about it. Have you ever seen any report of, of how much your EMF your car emits or any formal official report saying uh, uh, which uh, does a com internal combustion engine a car built with an internal combustion engine, how do those emissions compare to an electric car versus a hybrid? No, none of that stuff is reported because it's not regulated. So a ton of sources are not regulated at all. And that tends, in my experience, that tends to shock people and make them interested in engaging further with the subject. Next, the regulations that do exist are insufficient. All, uh, they are based on something so let's talk about cell phones, for instance, cell phone radiation emissions regulations or laptops. These are based on something called the thermal effect, which is a boring name, but it's a pretty critical topic for EMF regulations, which means as long as your cell phone doesn't emit enough EMF to burn you, the government considers it to be safe. Let me just repeat that. As long as your cell phone doesn't burn you, the government considers it to be safe. And that's what all of these EMF emissions regulations that do exist, what they're based on. They're all designed to protect you from immediate term damage, immediate. If it's not doing damage to you immediately, it's, that's not a, something the government regulations are to care about at all. They don't, they're, they're not set up to even try to pretend to protect you against these non-immediate health effects. Things like infertility, cancer, and the more serious conditions that we, we touched on earlier. These regulations aren't, they're, they're not designed to even try to protect you from those effects. And I said there were three points. Here's the third. The regulations that do exist are not enforced. So for example, cell phone regulation, we'll use this example again, it's regulated. In the US, the permissible levels are determined by the FCC, but the FCC does not do any testing. This is what a, a lot of people don't know this. They think, oh, it's FCC certified. It, the FCC did the testing. No, the FCC doesn't do any of this testing. The cell, so when it comes to cell phones, who does the testing? The manufacturer of the phone, and then they report the results to the FCC. And that means that companies cheat and lie. The example I like using is the phone gate example. This was a few years ago out of France where a uh, group of researchers sued the government, forced them to release data. The, the French government had tested, independently tested, hundreds of cell phones themselves. And they found that 89% of them exceeded their published radiation levels. And many of them exceeded legal levels and eventually were recalled from the market. This is a very effective example 
showing that it's not just me saying the system is set up to allow manufacturers to cheat. They've actually been caught doing it. And uh, just last year in the United States, the Chicago Tribune did a similar investigation. They paid for their own testing at an FCC certified laboratory of 11 phones and found again that they exceeded more red radiation than, than legally allowed. Now, a lot of the time, the information on the previous slides is enough to get people thinking seriously, but sometimes uh, people just have trouble accepting that the government would allow the sale of harmful products. So how can all this be true? Why would the government allow these cell phone companies to sell me something if it's, if it's harmful? So I like having some examples ready because there are literally tons of examples of governments allowing the sale of harmful products. But as you've seen throughout this talk and throughout my materials, I like keeping things simple, simple enough for people to get their heads around. So I come prepared and I've given you three examples that you can use. And I picked these three because each is an example of a, of a different a different flaw in, in the regula uh, regulatory regime. So one is, for instance, thalidomide, which is a drug sold as a treatment for morning sickness in pregnant women before we knew it could cause tr tragic birth defects. So this is an example of a product being released with insufficient testing. Uh, the second one, one people often use with EMF and cell phones is smoking. Smoking was widely known to be harmful decades before the regulations caught up. Uh, and so now we're at a similar point with EMF. Uh, there is now decades, there's a large body of science that is decades old, demonstrating significant health effects from exposure to this stuff. Uh, but the regulations still don't realize it. And the third example is when regulations are cheated. And the example there, it's very recent. A lot of people still remember it. It's Dieselgate, where Volkswagen rigged the test to show that their car, their diesel cars emitted less pollution than they really did. And as we just saw in the example of the phone gate, we have the same situation with cell phones where the regulations are cheated. So these are three examples. They're, they're not obscure and they each illustrate a different area, a different way in which the regulations are, are, are failing us as, as human beings and as consumers when it comes to issues of EMF and health. Another sip, please pardon me. So does 5G increase the risks? Now in the overview, I broke this into two simple sentences. Uh, one, 5G uses new frequencies, never before used in consumer applications. And two, 5G means an explosion in the number of sources of this stuff in our environment, which means much more of the radiation in our environment. If the person you're talking to is interested in 5G, in this thread, in this part of your approach to the discussion, then I have some more ways of explaining the health risks. First, I come prepared with the definition of 5G, just like you should come prepared with the definition of EMF, you should also come prepared with the definition of 5G because a lot of people, even, even if they're worried about 5G or they've heard they should be worried about 5G or they heard they're getting 5G, they don't know what it is. 5G is the fifth generation of cell phone networks replacing 4G LTE. So in 1979, when the first cell phone was released, that was 1G. And in 2008, um, when the last generation came, that was 4G. Uh, and now in 2020, we're getting 5G. It actually started rolling out in, in 2019, but the, it's really picked up steam in 2020. So it's the fifth generation. Uh, and it's a completely new technology and infrastructure for cell phone networks. So that, again, it's nice, short, accurate description, definition of what 5G is. Now, like all wireless technology, uh, 5G uses a form of EMF to communicate. It's important to, from, from that quick definition, to bring people back to your topic. Why is 5G relevant to issues of EMF and health? Well, 5G is a form of EMF. And there are literally thousands of high quality, tens of thousands, of high quality peer reviewed scientific studies linking this radiation to numerous negative health outcomes like infertility and cancer. And 
again, tying back into the top level expression about health effects. 5G uses new frequencies of EMF that have never before been used in consumer applications. These can have more than 50 times as much energy as a 4G cell signal. And this is the point that, I, again, I, not everyone is going to agree with me on this. I think is the most critical when it comes to expressing uh, five, the, 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 the risks of 5G. It's more than just for cell phones. It's the whole Internet of Things. In the minds, in the, in the visions and the dreams of these companies that are deploying this stuff, basically everything in your life becomes a source of 5G. Um, they just canceled the Consumer Electronics Show, CES. They, didn't, they canceled the in-person part. Um, for next year, it's a huge technology show. I try to go every year. Uh, this January, it's going to be only online. But all you need to do is spend five minutes walking around the CES uh, show show floor, the exhibit hall, just to see what I'm talking about. Go 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 into the LG uh, booths and the whole home, everything. The air conditioner uh, is is smart. The refrigerator is smart. Your in-home dry cleaner is smart. Your vacuum cleaner is smart. Your outlets are smart. Everything is smart. And all of these can become sources of 5G because 5G is built to support the Internet of Things. And that I, I know I keep harping on it it's because I think it's so important. You don't want to bore your, your people, like the people you're talking to, like I'm, I might be boring you. But it really is critical to understand how, how many sources of 5G there are going to be. Now, coming back. Does 5G increase health risks? Yes, I think so, because 5G is untested. There has been no testing into the long-term health effects of 5G radiation in, human, in humans. So not only has, have these frequencies never been deployed in consumer applications before, but there's no testing. Now, this isn't really a surprise for those of us involved in EMF issues, because that's exactly how all EMF technology is deployed. First, it's rolled out, and then over the subsequent years and decades, we get the science. But while this doesn't surprise people like me, you'll find it does surprise a lot of regular consumers who just, just like they think all products are safe, they think that, that they've all been tested for safety. And it's just not the true. Uh, it's just not true. And, and I think you'll find in your discussions that this ties in nicely uh, and cleanly with the talking points about regulation. Now, this is the final point um, under 5G that I cover. It's for reasons like this that cities around the world, from Brussels, Belgium, to Easton, Connecticut, are banning 5G. In marketing, there's a term called social proof. And when you visit my homepage at shieldyourbody.com, you'll see it. I have logos of businesses like ABC Television and the Chicago Tribune and Electric Sense. Um, and reviews from my customers about my baby blanket and my phone pouch. That's because when someone is coming to my website for the first time, when they see that social proof that I appeared on ABC News or that someone liked my baby blanket, that helps give them confidence in my business, my products, and my message. And that's what this point is about. It shows people that you're talking to that a lot of people are taking 5G very seriously. Brussels, it's not only the capital city of Belgium, it's also the home of the European Parliament. It's a real city where real business happens. It's, a, it's on the news, an important city. And they've put a moratorium on 5G precisely because the wireless companies could not demonstrate consumer safety. There's a lot of other cities around the world that you could cite. I have a running list on my website that, again, you'll, you can link to it out of the resources you're getting today. Um, so there's a lot of cities you can cite. Again, I, I like coming up with a couple of them to keep it simple and and you know coming prepared with links you know if someone wants more i can send them oh here check out this list on this page but really simplifying it and the brussels example is a i find a very powerful one when communicating with people so now we get to the final point which really is the most important now it's important that you you get all the other points right leading up to this because you're not going to get to this final point unless you 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 hit uh, you hit the earlier ones you hit it right you hit it in a way that that they cared and they wanted to learn more but this is the most important one because if you don't hit this point right nothing is going to happen 
uh, as a result of all your effort talking to the people you care about. So this is crucial. Everything leading up to this was to get people interested, to get them aware, to get them worried, but, uh, but not scared. I, I can talk more about that in the q and I don't like scaring people. I like communicating calmly and, and confidently about things that are worrisome, but without trying to scare people because that people don't make good decisions when they're scared. But the whole purpose of leading up to this is to get people motivated to do something. So what is that something? Well, as I said, if you're following my framework, then you already have your ask in mind, the thing that you want them to do, the change that you want them to make. But as I also said, sometimes this stuff just comes up in conversation and you haven't thought of an ask. So that's why I prepped these materials. What's important here is that you express to people how easy it is to start making changes to improve their health and reduce their risks. You are not asking people to give up technology. Uh, you're not even asking them to buy anything. You're asking them to make a simple change that's free, that's easy, that's effective, that will improve their health. And it all comes down to two simple rules. This point is obvious, the first rule. It's obvious, but it bears repeating. Minimize your use of tech, because the less tech you use, the less EMF you're exposed to. But that doesn't mean you're telling people to give up their phones. I, there, you'll, you'll know that there's, there's an immediate reflex opposition to the, use less tech. No, I'm not giving up my phone. I'm not asking you to give up your phone, but maybe turn off your Wi-Fi router at night. You're not even using it overnight. Uh, you'll save energy, you'll save on your power bill, and you'll be exposed to less radiation. Or put your phone into airplane mode when you don't need it on. There are a lot of these examples. I, I, I just gave a couple of the most popular ones here, um, but there's a lot of examples. I have a lot of them on my blog. There's a lot of ways that people can use less tech without sacrificing their enjoyment of tech at all or very minimally. Now, the second is a, perhaps a less intuitive point for many people, but it's also vital to understand with EMF is to maximize distance. So when you're first, the first rule is to minimize your use of tech. The second rule is to maximize the distance between that tech and your body when you are using it. And the, the reason that matters so much is because the power of EMF diminishes exponentially with distance. Every additional inch, even millimeter, makes a big difference in your exposure. So the most common example I tell people is not to carry your phone in your pocket. It's, it's one of the basic things. I mean, it's hard for a lot of people, A, because it's a habit, and then B, you know, for a lot of people, they might not have, you know, especially let's say men uh, who aren't carrying a backpack, they, they don't have another place on their body to carry their phone. Uh, so there, there, there is some opposition, but this is soup. This is a super important one is to not carry your phone in your pocket. Cause when it's in your pocket, it's right up against your body. You're getting a full power dose off of that device. Uh, and it's constantly emitting EMF radiation. Another example is not to use your laptop in your lap. The, because the power of EMF diminishes exponentially with distance, that's why even as the number of sources of EMF in our environment continue to explode, it's what you do with the tech that's closest to you and most in your control that can have such a major impact on your exposure and your health risks. Ah. So <laughs> I survived. <laughs> I want to thank all of you for taking the time to go through this information with me. It's my goal to give you the tools to start a conversation about the serious issues of EMF and health. And in today's session, I covered all of the core topics from a very high level. It's literally what you will find when you download my infographics, but I put this information in the infographics because I find it to be a very effective way to rapidly and convincingly and accurately communicate these issues. It, it doesn't get you, it doesn't, it doesn't fix the world, it starts the conversation. As someone who, who uh, works on creating the most effective content for my valued readers and customers, I know how important it is to serve information in the best mode to be consumed because every person is different. 
So as you go through the resource guide, and this is just a screenshot of one of the pages from the resource guide, you'll see I've made videos, infographics, eBooks, blog posts, all to help give you more options for sharing this type of information. And I did this specifically to make it easier for you to advocate these issues with more people. For example, one of my friends loves to read the highlights and doesn't want to get feel, to feel lectured at. Uh, if he likes what he reads and sees visually, he'll go ahead and find more information about the topic. So I'd give him the infographic. But his mother, on the other hand, is constantly busy, hates reading, but she loves YouTube. So for her, I'll send the video version of the same content. Think about your loved ones or whomever it is you're trying to speak to and how they consume information. I'm certain you'll find something in the tool chest that's perfect for them. And you can access all of these resources in the kit I'll be sending you uh, shortly after this webinar is over, as soon as the recording of the webinar is done. So as we wrap the educational portion of the webinar, I want to share some encouragement. When you're concerned about EMF, I understand how just how overwhelming it can sometimes feel. After all, they keep making more and more wireless devices. Not just new phones, but smart cars and smart meters and smart watches and smart thermostats. And so many cell towers are going up every day and more and more satellites are going into space. But it's also remember important to remember that you are not helpless. It's true, you alone can't stop Apple from making iPhones. Or you alone can't stop Samsung or can't force Samsung to make safer phones. But you alone can make a big difference in your personal exposure based on how you engage with technology. And you alone can help make other people safer by educating them on these important issues. And that in turn will contribute to the larger goals of slowing the 5G rollout, for example, or slowing the deployment of satellite internet that's, that's being deployed right now to blanket the planet. Because the more people who think twice about upgrading their device or about getting a new form of smart tech, the, the slower that tech will roll out. The more people who tell realtors that they are concerned about EMF levels in homes, the more the market will learn that that's a priority. And the more motivated people will be to make their homes safer and oppose tower deployments in their neighborhood, for example, even if they don't personally care about EMF because they do care about their home value. The more people who are aware, the more people who start to take back control from EMF from the wireless companies. And the way to do that is to learn how to communicate these issues uh, and, uh, calmly and effectively. That's how it all starts. And that's why I, I'm preparing this content I've been spending the whole summer on. Now, before we get to Q&A, there is one more thing. Uh, as you can tell, uh, this is not a sales webinar. I'm not talking about any of my products and I'm not gonna go into a sales pitch, but I do like giving a little something as a token of thanks to everyone who shows up and, and sits through one of my webinars with me. So as promised, I do have a special offer for all of you. So for the next few hours until midnight tonight, Pacific time. So that is, um, uh, <laughs> it's too, so for the next 10 hours, um, just enter advocate 20 at checkout to save 20% on your order, any order. Um, this, is, uh, this is only for those of you here in the room. Uh, by the time anyone sees this on YouTube or whatever archive, this coupon code will, will not work. So this, again, as a token of thanks for those of you who showed up, save 20% on any order from my website in the next 10 hours. It expires at midnight tonight, Pacific time. Okay, I'm seeing a lot of questions. Um, so I will try, let me, let me start, let's see, I'm just gonna scan and compare. Um, if you, uh, by the way, if you still have questions, um, you can just post them here. Okay, so I'll get through the ones first here in the room and uh, then jump over to, to some of the others from before that some of you filled out. Um, Elaine asked, if a cell phone is near you, is the top hotter with EMFs than the bottom? In the other words, it, is it um, better to direct a certain portion of the phone farther away from your body? Okay, that's a really good question, Elaine. Um, I can answer in general terms, but keeping in mind, it can be different based on the, 
the variety of different models that of phones that are out there and also various um, circumstances uh, that you're using it in, you know, like where the towers are that you're connected to and so forth. Um, in general, and I haven't even tested it on this phone, but I'll, I'll hold up the phone as an example. Uh, in general, um, um, more radiation is, is, is designed to come out of the lower bottom, the back, sorry, the lower bottom, the lower back. Um, and that's because it's in general designed to radiate away from the head. Uh, that doesn't mean none comes out of the front. Trust me, if you take a, a meter and measure, you'll see there's plenty that comes out of the front, but more comes out of the back. Um, and generally, to my understanding, it's the bottom, not the top, that has the higher emissions. Uh, but that varies widely based on a large number of criteria. And um, uh, the best bet is to, to, to measure it yourself with a meter. Um, and uh, also just to, to keep it as far away from, from you as possible. Thank you, Elaine. Harriet asks, what is the other website beside Bioinitiative Report? Um, and oh, Stephanie already gave that to you. So yeah, it's emf-portal.org. That's the one that has over 30,000 studies. Uh, and I think it has over 6,000 summaries also. Uh, but it's, it's, uh, it's very searchable and you can, you can explore there. Thank you, Harriet. Elaine says, when I was young, my father would not let me get near the color TV because of the radiation. Is EMF from our phones the same things? Is that what we used to call radiation? It is. Uh, I, you know, I, my, my parents told me the same thing. I'm, 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 old, I'm old enough <laughs> to, to, to have dealt with that same uh, issue. I'm trying to remember, though, I, if, you know what, let me to uh, cathode, oh, sorry, tubes, x-rays. Yes, OK, so I was right. I haven't thought about this in a long time, so I apologize. I had to look it up. Um, they also emitted x-rays. So x-rays are a form of EMF. They have much, much, much more energy than the types of non-ionizing EMF that we're talking about with cell phones. So old TVs did uh, emit the same type of EMF that we're talking about, uh, non-ionizing, but they also emitted x-rays. And x-rays, uh, they emitted a very small amount, but x-rays are super dangerous, <laughs> even a very small amount. That's why you all, you know, you know always wear a lead apron when, when you get your dental x-rays done and why the technician isn't even in the same room with you. So it's the same, it is, the old TVs did do EMF. They were also in some ways more dangerous, um, but in other ways they weren't because you didn't carry them around in your pocket 24 hours a day. So uh, I hope that gave you some context to answer your question. Thank you. Um, David, uh, Stephanie, I think you see David's question so you can get in touch with him. Joan asks, when a phone is in airplane mode, uh, does it emit any radiation at all? Is this a completely safe mode? It ba Joan, great question. It basically doesn't emit any EMF at all. It does emit a tiny, 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 tiny bit. Uh, and that's because there's still a battery running and powering your device. Um, but it's so low. In my experience, you'd be hard pressed to measure it with any consumer grade device. Um, so it, it, using airplane mode cuts out so much radiation that, um, that I, I, I try, I mean, there's so many other sources of EMF in the environment. Um, I just, uh, I guess I'm trying to say that I, I find that turning off air, uh, turning your phone into airplane mode is sufficient. I, nothing is completely safe. It doesn't completely eliminate the emissions, uh, but I find that very powerful protection. Thank you. Um, Marjorie has a very nice compliment for me. So thank you, Marjorie. I really appreciate that. Renate asks, my EMF meter shows high levels of electricity Rather than high levels of EMF, I am confused by this. I thought electricity also generates EMF. Electricity does generate EMF. Um, uh, I'm not sure I fully understand the question. You, you, you might want to email us hello at shieldyourbody.com 
and uh, we can try to get you a better answer. Um, the one thing I will say is in the resource guide you're getting um, after this is done, if you haven't downloaded it already, in the section about what is EMF, download the ebook because the ebook of, that I that about what is EMF, the, the specific, I'm talking about specifically the what is EMF ebook. Um, that does go into the, it breaks down a few things that I think are relevant to your question. One is that the flow of electricity uh, generates EMF. Two is some of the differences between electric fields, magnetic fields, and wireless frequency fields. Um, but without knowing a bit more about your question, I, I, I'm not sure I can give you any more information than that right this moment, but just email in hello at shieldyourbody.com. Thank you, Renata. Elaine asks, when they use your phone to spy on you, can they still do that if the battery is dead? Uh, I am not an expert in that area. You know, my my gut would tell me that they can't, um, but but uh, I'm not I'm I'm not sure uh, honestly. <laughs> uh, so it's a, it's an interesting question, um, but I would have thought that they can't do it when your phone is off. And I've been reading some things um, that, that suggest that they can and that you have to take out the SIM card completely in order to start. So I don't, I just don't know the answer, but thank you, Elaine. Okay, so um, we still have uh, people in the room. So I am going to try to go through some of these questions that you folks all submitted beforehand. There were a lot this time. Um, and Stephanie, you can ping me if there's something in the room I should look back to. So someone asks, how do I protect my family, including small children, from 5G levels that are really high, like 60 gigahertz? I haven't been able to find protective clothing that blocks these levels, especially in child sizes. Okay, so that's a, a, a really good question that I want, uh, there's a couple of parts that I wanna answer. Uh, so first, just because a product doesn't claim to shield against 60 gigahertz, doesn't mean it doesn't. And I'll tell you, because I just have been going through this with my own product catalog. Uh, I, uh, I've had to go back this year and retest my products uh, for 5G frequencies. And, you know, so depending on the lab at the time I can get it done, they, they go up to 20, 26, or 40 gigahertz. I can't even get a test done for higher than 40 gigahertz. So if I wanted to get a 60 gigahertz test done, I, I right now don't know where I would get that done. So, uh, and so let's take my boxers, for example. I got test results back on those recently. They're up on the website. The boxers shield up to 40 gigahertz. I can say that now because I have the test results. Before I had the test results, it doesn't mean they didn't shield up to 40 gigahertz. It, it just means I couldn't say that they did. And I think you'll find that that's the case with a lot of EMF shielding products out there right now, whether they're for me or anyone else. Um, there's, there's limitations in the testing. Uh, so just because a product doesn't can't yet say it shields up to 60 gigahertz doesn't mean it doesn't. It also means, in, to my knowledge, there isn't even a product out yet, an EMF shielding product out yet that can uh, legitimate, legitimately claim based on independent lab data that it does shield against 60 gigahertz. I have not seen that. And I don't think any company can say that yet um, because the testing isn't available. Now that said, to my knowledge, there are no 5G deployments anywhere near 60 gigahertz yet. Not in the not the, the the 5G rollouts we hear about happening all around the world with the cell towers and so forth. Right now in the United States, for example, to my knowledge, there are no consumer deployments of 5G that go above eight gigahertz. Now they will will they go higher? Almost certainly. 5G spectrum can go up to 300 gigahertz, and at some point they will. But right now there shouldn't be any 5G deployments um, that go above eight gigahertz. That's my understanding. Um, someone asked, how does SYB technology compare with products from Synergy for, for EMF blocking? I get a lot of questions about uh, Synergy. Um, they have a very interesting looking product. Um, the one thing I can say is that SYB technology is shielding technology. It's based on the same basic principles that have been around for about 200 years uh, since the Faraday cage was invented, which is you can weave conductive metallic material in such a pattern that it, it, it bounces EMF radiation away. Synergy does not sell shielding products. They sell other types of products uh, that claim to protect you from EMF. So that's the one just objectively uh, clear difference between uh, uh, products from my company and other shielding companies and products from Synergy. 
Um, looking, what immediate symptoms will 5G give off? Uh, that is, hard. well, as I said, it's untested. Um, what I think you'll find is if you're looking at immediate symptoms, then the closest analog to what we know is something called uh, electromagnetic hypersensitivity or EHS. And I have information on that posted on my blog. There are, that's sometimes known as Wi-Fi allergies. And these are people who have greater sensitivity to exposure uh, from, to EMF radiation exposure than, than the average public. And the symptoms, like I say, they're called Wi-Fi allergies. They're kind of like allergic level symptoms, although that's not to diminish. There, there can be very serious allergies. Um, people can die, for example, from peanut allergies. So there, um, the uh, so, but the 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 symptoms can can range quite quite a, a across a broad spectrum. And I think if you're looking at immediate term symptoms, that's that's the, you're going to be looking at the same sorts of results. In terms of longer term symptoms, I think you're going to see the same, uh, I mean, when it's eventually studied, you're going to see very similar outcomes. That is, you'll see increased rates of tumors. You'll see increased rates of some types of cancers. You'll see increased rates of infertility. You'll see increased rates of, of, um, of sleep disrupt, melatonin uh, production disruption, which leads to sleep disruption and so forth. Because 5G, it does have its own unique set of risks and worries, but it's also, at the end of the day, EMF. And there, there, it, 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 I think you're going to end up seeing a lot of the same manifestations that, that have been studied over the past decades. Uh, people think I am alarmist and making a bigger deal out of things because if it were true that it was really harmful, it would not be allowed. Well, that's exact. So I gave you a few examples uh, to, to address because, because obviously I've encountered that too, and it's natural. Um, for a lot of people just to think that. One I didn't say, um, because it wasn't really about regulation because it came so far ahead of regulation, but there was a point in time where doctors did cigarette ads, like literally, not actors playing doctors, <laughs> doctors did cigarette ads, and they would actually make some health claims in them. So there is a point in time uh, at which we, uh, at which uh, that pre, the, so we all we'd all look back at that today and think that's ludicrous because we all know that cigarette smoking is so harmful. Um, but there was a point in time when it wasn't. It doesn't mean I mean smoking wasn't less harmful before we knew it was harmful. <laughs> it just wasn't widely recognized. And it took decades from when the first indications about lung cancer came in order uh, between then and when it became widely acknowledged as a, a serious health risk. Um, I'm so reading through questions here. So my biggest concern is the cell towers being placed in neighborhoods, literally next to houses, apartments, senior residents. And for those who have to pack, what can one do to lower the risk of accumulation buildup in your vehicle? Okay, there's a lot of questions in this one. Let me start by that. What can one do to lower the risk of radiation accumulation buildup in your vehicle? Great question. It's something I think about a lot. I get asked a lot about car in-car radiation exposure, um, and I don't have any answers. I mean, any EMF apparel, shielding apparel. Like uh, right now, I, I make uh, men's boxers. I make a unisex bandana. I have a beanie for babies. Um, there's other companies that sell other types of EMF shielding clothing. It, those will work in any environment. So if, if you're at work, if you're at home, if you're in your car, they will protect the parts of your body that you cover. Beyond EMF shielding clothing, I'm not really sure uh, what you can do in your vehicle, but it's something I'm looking at. Uh, as for smartphones, do you have the option not to upgrade from 4G to 5G? Yes, you definitely do. Uh, in fact, right now, you, you have to pay quite a bit extra to get a 5G phone. Now, I'm sure that'll change in a couple of years, um, but as long as you don't get a 5G-enabled phone, uh, you won't be on 5G. It doesn't stop it being deployed in your neighborhood or in your environment, but it does mean your phone specifically will not be 5G. Um, are there any petitions being implemented to notify Congress and Senate? Yes, there are. I don't have that list handy if you email in. Um, but uh, for instance, uh, the Environmental Health Trust is leading a, um, a lawsuit against the FCC right now about regulations. 
Uh, and there are some, I believe Richard Blumenthal out of Connecticut, I think it is, um, is uh, has been holding hearings uh, and, and sending letters to the FCC about 5G and testing and safety standards and so forth. So there is activity and I don't have it top of mind. Um, but if you email in, we'll do our best to find that for you. Um, will there be plans to make your devices more affordable so the mass majority can also have the ability to protect themselves? Uh, I would love to. Uh, I'm working hard on it, constantly working hard on it. The thing is, well, two things. One is our source materials are very expensive. Um, like uh, all of my apparel, for example, uses silver. Uh, and I don't know if you've, and, and I mean silver, <laughs> like not, not metaphorical silver, a literal precious metal. And, uh, you know, something like the baby blanket or the boxers that uses, a, or the bandana uses a lot of it. And I don't know if you've seen the price of silver in the past couple of weeks, but it's exploded. Um, the other, so we use expensive materials. The other part of that is that we're not a huge company. I mean, we're big in EMF protection, but, uh, you know, when you compare us to, I don't know, pick a name out of a hat, Nike, you know, we're not even a drop in the bucket. So we're not producing at the volume that allows us to get those, the types of economies of scale yet. So eventually I expect that we will be able to, it's something I'm definitely, I'm def I would love to sell uh, as affordably as possible. I think you find though, that our prices for most of our products are very, very competitive. Um, I'm over 65, therefore I'm trying to share this info with others in my age range. They don't seem to be concerned as I am about effects of EMF. What can I say to get their attention? Good question. I get that one a lot. Um, the thing that I find, and it won't apply to all of, all, all of that age group, but a lot of them have grandkids and they care a lot about their grandkids. So they might not care but they do care about their grandkids. So approaching it from the risks, the health risks of children, I find can be very effective if they have children or grandchildren uh, in particular. Beyond that, uh, I, I, I don't know specifically uh, how topics to approach the over 65 demographic, um, but I'll think about that some more. But the grandchildren thing is, is really powerful. Um, will 5G harm uh, cause harm to our pets and wildlife? Well, uh, again, I, I think it's almost certain. Uh, I have a post on the website um, uh, that goes into, it's a pretty long post about health effects on nature, wildlife, and pets. And again, it's, it's a survey. Uh, it doesn't go into depth of all the hundreds of studies on, on this or thousands, actually, when you're we're talking about wildlife, all the studies that are, but it gives you a sense and the same types of effects you see in humans, unsurprisingly, you're seeing in all living things, because as I was explaining, you know, EMF impacts all of our biological systems and impacts DNA. All living things share biological systems and DNA. So you're going to start seeing the same impacts. Um, how can you measure how much EMF is coming into your house from the hydro pole if the wire connects on the roof? Um, the way to measure how much EMF is coming from anywhere is to test. And I have um, a, a whole bunch of resources, including meter recommendations uh, uh, and uh, tutorials and so forth on, about that. If you go to shieldyourbody.com slash test. I'm just going to see if there's some more comments. Okay. Let's see. Joan asks, I never, I'm jumping back into the questions from the room now. Joan asks, I've never, I never hear anything about satellite dishes for TV, like direct TV. Is it dangerous to have a dish right on your roof? Does this direct radiation into your home? You know, I haven't taken those measurements myself, but um, yes, those are my, so I did actually at one point, I, I had satellite internet. Um, and it was, uh, it was from a company called Hughes. And uh, I, I never, this was, this was before I got into EMF and I didn't own any meters back then. Um, but, but I, I do remember it is a microwave transmitter that they're mounting right on your roof. Now more because it's a satellite. Am I still on camera? Yeah. Because it's a satellite and has this dish, more of it is being pushed away from you than is coming to you, but it's still a source right there on your roof. So it's definitely a source. Now, how 
cons uh, how how much EMF is that? How much of a risk does it present? You know, in all things, I always say test because EMF it's invisible, has no odor, has no taste. The only way to know how much of it there is and where it's coming from is to test. And you can get a decent meter starting at about 150 bucks, and it gives it starts illuminating this whole part of the world that that's otherwise completely invisible to you. Um, but when it comes to is it dangerous to have a dish right on your roof? You know, it, as with anything with EMF, this actually this is a good opportunity for me to say. So, the 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 best option is always not to have it, but EMF emitting technology does bring a lot of use and value and entertainment and enjoyment in our lives. In my case, you know, when I had satellite, I needed internet. I needed to be able to work. Um, so then you see, is there a way that I can get it further away from my home? It can, can, will, will the, the, you have direct TV, you say, so can I mount it on a pole in the yard or on a fence of mine instead of right on my house? Is that even an option? If it is, do that. So, First, you evaluate, do I really need the source of EMF in my life? And sometimes the answer is yes. And then you say, how, how far away from me can I get it? And then uh, that's what you do, because you, you're not going to give up all EMF emitting technology. Um, but everything is an additional source, so you try to take the precautions that you can. I hope that answered your question. But the short answer is test. I would strongly recommend testing. Hello, Emma asks, uh, what are the best ways to protect babies in high density apartments? Um, I hear you, I see you have silver thread products. What are the effects of babies of silver thread products uh, for large parts of the day? Many thanks. Okay, let me answer the second part of that question first. Um, there should be no effects uh, uh, from using silver along the body for large parts. That's specifically why we use silver in our apparel and we don't we don't use silver in our other products that don't come into con extended contact with your skin. Uh, so, for instance, you know my phone pouch, the five G phone shield, the flex shields, uh, the poster frame liners. None of those use silver, and that's because we we can get very high degree of shielding effectiveness without all the expense of, sh of silver. Um, the reason we use silver uh, it, in our apparel is because it is uh, hy hypoallergenic. It's also antibacterial and antimicrobial. And that's in addition to having its, its uh, EMF shielding capabilities. So that's specifically why we use silver uh, in all of our apparel, not just the baby products. Now, the best way to protect babies in high density, it's, it, it is more important to protect babies in high density apartments, but there's no difference in protecting babies versus adults. So all of the same uh, protection techniques that I advocate, that I make products for, those all apply to babies too. So um, except for babies, it can like, you can wrap them in a blanket and, and get in a beanie and, and basically protect their whole bodies much more cost effectively than you can shield an adult who's much bigger. Uh, but, you know, turn off the devices that are optional that you can turn off, turn off your Wi-Fi at night. Um, keep the crib away from power outlets. Uh, put your phone into airplane mode when it's not needed or certain, certainly don't sleep with it. Keep all as many electronics out of the baby's room as possible. These are all the same tips and advice I give for adults. They also apply to baby. They're just more important for babies. There's nothing in particular that I would recommend for a baby as opposed to an adult, just that it's more important. I hope that answers your question, Emma. Thank you for asking. Marjorie says, seniors should care because of the increase in possibility of cognitive issues, dementia as we age. Yes, I agree. Um, uh, but it's also, it's hard to say, I mean, in terms of making this compelling for the senior that you're talking to, it's hard to say how, what type, how long it takes for the, well, okay. <laughs> I guess, you know, because a lot of the, the damage that occurs when someone is young, it can take decades to form it can then, they still have to live for decades and so forth. The older someone is, the, the less I find that they care to think in those terms. Um, I mean, it's a good suggestion. It's worth trying. I'd be interested to see how that, how that plays out. But thank you, Marjorie. 
Um, Elaine also wanted, uh, if, I'm sorry, I forget who's Emma. I think it was Emma's question. Elaine wants Emma to know no baby monitors. <laughs> so thank you for, for throwing that in. Um, so there were some more questions submitted beforehand, but I'm sorry, as I, as I said, I'm, I'm actually a little under the weather today. I'm, I'm normally game to go the full two hours. I'm already losing my voice. <laughs> and I honestly just, I, I need to, uh, uh, get back to bed. So I want to thank everyone. Uh, I promise the next one will be long again. Um, uh, I, I want to thank everyone for tuning out, tur turning out today. Uh, one final reminder, we do have this sale. It goes on uh, for another nine and a half hours until midnight Pacific uh, tonight. So if there's any product you want in my store, any combination of products you want from my store, just enter advocate uh, 20 at checkout and you'll save 20 percent. just do that before midnight and again I, you know i really want to thank all of you for coming out um and and listening to what i have to say i i really do appreciate you choosing to spend your valuable time with me and um i hope uh i hope this has been useful and informative stay tuned for the uh resource guide that you'll be getting in a couple, an hour or two as soon as the the archive of this webinar is done that'll be emailed straight to you uh, I, please do check it out and uh, please let me know what you think of it because this is an important set of content I feel that I've been working on this summer and I'm planning to continue work on it and uh, I'd really like to hear how well this is working for you in real life or what changes you'd like to see to it. So thank you very much everyone and have a great rest of your day.